good morning. Thanks so much for joining us today. Would you stand? Let's worship together.
we thank you so much this morning, God, um, that you are so worthy of all of our praise. God, that there is no one else, that there is no nothing else um, in the world, Lord, that is as worthy as you are. You know, I was listening to one of my bandmates um, practicing yesterday. Um, going through the first song and I was just reminded of our New Year's resolutions um, and already on January 5th I see people posting on Facebook um, scratch 2020 2021 is gonna be my year you know they're like I've already been eating ice cream for dinner or I didn't get up to go go on my run or whatever their resolution that they had made for themselves or the goal that they had set they have already um, failed after you know just five days um, and I just couldn't help but thinking that it's in our failures, that it's in wayward resolutions and our frustrations um, that we see the glory of the Lord. And I was thinking back on the story of Lazarus um, in the first song that we sang together and I was reminded of um, Lazarus' sisters who, who don't believe and of Lazarus who, who had to die. Um, and you know, the Lord actually told his disciples, I'm glad that he's dead because now you get to see something even more miraculous. That is through our failures, through our disbelief and even our own death, um, that we see the most powerful of miracles. Lord, I ask um, that you would just encourage us right now. God, that no matter what our day or what our year turns out to be, um, no matter whether we stick to our resolutions for six minutes or six weeks or six months, um, Lord, that they won't make you love us anymore, that they won't make us any more deserving um, of love. God, that your faith, that your miraculous abilities um, are the same as they were December 31st of 2019, the same as they are in 2020, the same as they will be forever on. Lord, that you are the only thing that is worth striving for. That you are the only one that is worth striving to please. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Amen. Oh, 
longer prisoners. We are no longer slaves. We are no longer shackled because God is setting us free. Sing it out. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. But you called me a citizen of heaven. you this morning for who you are. God, that, that the word of God says, your mercies begin afresh each morning. And God, we are just so thankful for that, that you are the God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, and that nothing we could ever do would make you love us any less. God, we're just so thankful for that. We're thankful that any wall that is placed before us by the enemy, any barrier that we feel like we're stuck at, that those walls come tumbling down in your name, Jesus. That we are free and that this freedom and this, this ability to walk out of the grave with you, we can, we can walk in that in truth this morning. And for the rest of the year and for the rest of our lives, God, it's a gift and we're just so thankful for that gift and we receive that gift this morning. We love you, Lord. We worship you for all who you are. Amen, amen. Isn't he good? Woo. All right. So what we are gonna do at this moment is we are gonna dismiss our kids. I see a few already lining up at the door over there. Give them a round of applause. We love having them worship with us. All right. For the rest of everybody still standing, maybe find somebody to shake a hand, give them a fist bump, ask them how they're doing. All right, good to see all of you. I got, uh, I got stopped being questioned if I was one of the band people. How about that? That's awesome. I've never considered myself to be a part of the band, but I guess this morning I am. And so you all uh, for joining us, thank you. We're so excited you would worship with us this morning. My name's Mark, if we haven't met yet. Uh, and we want to be able to connect with you. Uh, if this is your first time or first time in a while, there is a red connect card in the seat back in front of you. Uh, we would invite you to fill that out and bring that to us uh, after service out in the lobby. There's a room guest central where we can talk to you. I, I actually connected with a woman uh, last service that said, you know what, you always talk about these connect cards. And she said, I've now been here two and a half months uh, and I haven't filled this out. And I feel guilty at this point because I've been here too long to say that I'm just here get past that we would love to connect with you uh, and answer questions you have about our church help you get connected here at the church uh, and so please consider doing that if you are at all interested in being known uh, and being a part of this church we would love to connect with you we also, in the back of the room, we have the giving boxes that say uh, costly generosity on them back there. Uh, that is an opportunity for you to give your tithes or your offerings on the way in or way out of service. You can also give to our For the City vision uh, as well over these next three years. Uh, there as well in the back of the room, you can always still text to give and give online. 
Uh, if any of you ever have questions about giving or the process for us, um, we are trying to continually create space for us to respond as God leads us in generosity with our tithes and our gifts. Um, but we also want to acknowledge that for some people, this moment in time and finances in particular can be a challenging conversation or a challenging part of our life. And so we want to create opportunities for you to respond as God leads without the pressure of what people are doing or seeing around you. And so uh, we want to be able to pray over these gifts that we know uh, that God can do more with than we can do on our own. And so would you pray with me uh, as we pray for the offering this weekend? Father God, we thank you, God, just for your generosity, for all that we have here, for, God, every gift that you have given us, not just financially, God, but the gifts of, of community, the gifts of talents, the gifts of people. God, I pray that you would uh, take the specific financial gifts this weekend. God, that you would multiply them and grow them for your kingdom's sake, for the work that you want to uh, accomplish in this world and in this community through us and in us. And so God, just ask that you would take it and supernaturally, God, grow it. Uh, we just want to be obedient to all that you're calling us to do, God, and we know that you're our provider. So in this moment, God, we thank you for that. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this weekend is going to be, uh, it's going to be fun, interesting for us to be able to reflect. Many of you maybe have reflected uh, over the last few days or weeks preparing for the end of not just the year, but of a decade and, and going into a new one. And every year we want to take a little bit of time to celebrate some of the things that God has done in our church. And I want to be able to let you know that, that we're going to celebrate some areas and, and inevitably there are going to be some of you that are going to say, hey, you didn't talk about my ministry area or the thing that I did uh, or was a part of. And, and man, that's worthy of celebration. And you're right. And I would love uh, to be able to continue to celebrate those and and we're trying to do everything we can to gather information and be able to tell the story because I mean after all that's what this is about this isn't about just numbers and I'm going to give you a bunch of numbers but but it's about the stories behind the numbers it's about the hearts that are reflected and the lives that are changed as a result of these these numbers and so um over the next few minutes, uh, I'm going to give you some stats, some things that, that last night we have interpretation for uh, some deaf folks that uh, attend on our Saturday night. And our interpreter just kept looking over her shoulder and smirking at me with all these numbers as she's doing this thing. And, uh, and as we were going through it, I, I recognized that there are some of us that we get really, really excited about numbers. Others of us, um, I'm going to do my best to keep you engaged with me for just a minute because these are beautiful pictures of some of the ways that we've seen God move. And, and there are times in our year that, that there are things that we experience that are celebration worthy, that, that are on a grand scale, and sometimes things that are smaller that we can move past and not give God credit for. And so we see all through scripture, this practice of showing gratitude and thanksgiving to God for the things that he's done. And that's what we want to do today. I also want us to start to look at this next year and, and maybe provide a, a different perspective or encouragement on how we can engage this year. But before we do that, let's, let's take a minute just to look at and remember some of the things that we saw God do. You know, I, I immediately went to, you know, as I'm thinking of the, some of the ways that we've seen God do uh, just things that are a little bit beyond what we anticipated. You know, I was just even thinking about something like Trunk or Treat that, that for all intents and purposes is, is relatively easy. We decorate the backs of trunks and we hand out candy. And being like, man, this is our third, third, fourth year trying to do this thing. And to realize that not only did we back up tra traffic to 42 and 18 and make all the neighbors mad for people parking in their grass and in their driveways and all that stuff. I mean, we're just looking and going, man, God can use something as simple as a decorated trunk and a bowl full of candy to draw people. How much more should we be thankful and take encouragement that if people will come for that, that when we give them a real and authentic expression of God in their lives, that God can draw them as well. And so we want to look at some of these things and celebrate them. I, I reflect back on things like Festival and the, the crowd and the fun that we were able to have with that. Christmas, one of the most recent things, if you were able to join us for Christmas, we tried really hard to stay simple. To keep it simple and yet I felt like it was a stunning night of, of being able to gather together an afternoon to, to not just worship and to celebrate but to encounter the presence of God. 
And we're hearing stories. I actually had someone share um, just last week that one of their family members had come and, and they said, you know what? I don't know if they're going to heaven yet, but you know, um, they responded when you gave them the opportunity to be able to say, hey, I wanna take hold of this story. I wanna be a part. If, if God's real and, and these things are real, I wanna have that faith and whatever that means. And, and they put their hand up and said, yeah, that's what I want. And, and this, this parent was just telling me that maybe for the first time in years, they had a sense of hope with their family member, that maybe, just maybe, God was going to break through. And it's for those reasons that we celebrate all that you have done, all that you have uh, given, all that you have prayed into existence, all the invites that you have made. And over the last year, uh, we have invested a lot of time into some things. And I wanna highlight that, some of the time that you all have given. We uh, gathered information, we looked at serving schedules, number of people that served and when they served and all that. And uh, you might be surprised and hopefully encouraged by some of these things. More than a thousand hours over this last year were simply dedicated to opening doors and greeting people as they were walking in and out of our services. More than a thousand hours of people giving of that time uh, to be able to be a part and hopefully be welcomed into this space. We know that we handed out, not everybody takes them every week, but we know that we handed out uh, just over 11,000 programs for people coming in and out of service. And you'd also be really excited to know that only about 10,000 of those did we pick up off the floor after service uh, because you guys, uh you know, not you, your neighbor, obviously, uh, leave them behind. Um, at least 6,000 cups of coffee have been served and made and tea and all that stuff as well. Volunteers making that happen. The worship team, many times we don't recognize and, and, and really realize that all of these folks are up here serving voluntarily. They're giving of their time and their talent and showing up to lead us into the presence of God. We have kind of calculated that more than 620 songs have been sung over three weekend services over the last year with more than 450 hours being given to singing and leading us into worship um, every week. More than 300 hours have been given in social, uh, or in the media booth and in the, in the sound booth area, people not just getting trained, but actually serving in those capacities. In our student ministries, 45 meals were served to our students over this last year. And what's amazing about that is that's not us just going ahead and buying meals. We actually reached out to many of you. Many of you have given of your time and your resources to prepare food for our students. And knowing that 45 of those meals have been provided for directly because of the generosity of you has been amazing. More than 200 hours given to investing in our students, more than 400 hours invested in our, in our nursery and in our elementary area. This one, I'm not sure where they got the number, but I'm not going to question it because I don't wanna get involved. I've been told that more than 675 diapers have been changed in the last year in our nursery area and more than 1,500 cups of goldfish have been handed out. They're little cups, but I'm pretty confident Liam's responsible for about 500 of them. Uh, 312 hours given to our elementary students, 25 Christmas bags were given out to women at the Brighton Recovery Center. We go there once a month, we serve those women. That's awesome, I know. For the ladies that are serving there, I know you're excited about that. It's a, a place that we go, live-in facility for women whose lives are being changed as they're going through a process, we're investing in them. And as much as we get excited about the bags at Christmas and the Christmas party we throw for them, I'm, I'm even more excited to know that we invested uh, in 80 Bibles for the women that are there at the uh, Brighton Recovery Center. We gave out 80 Bibles to women to maybe be able to encounter God as they're in the midst of their recovery process, being able to encounter God through his word. We've had uh, more than 1,400 meals served to the homeless and under-resourced in Covington with uh, that equating to more than 450 hours given to serving those meals by volunteers in Covington. We've delivered more than 300 grocery bags in our uh, monthly grocery giveaway. And with that, more than 120 hours of actually walking those bags up to doors, knocking on doors, talking to people, asking if we can pray for them and encourage them and loving them, not just in a physical expression with food, but in a spiritual loving expression through prayer and building relationships. This year, we distributed more than 120 uh, Thanksgiving meals and spent a total of volunteer hours of 80 hours handing them out, praying for people to receive them. 
And then this one is one that you might not see. You might not uh, see because they're not doing the work when you're here, but you'd notice if they didn't do it. Um, a number of years ago, we, uh, when we first got here, we were trying to save money everywhere we could and cut every corner we possibly could to be able to steward the resources as fiercely as we could because we had to. And we still do that. I, I'm still in that space. But, but this is one that we were like, man, we've got to save some money on, on caring for our property. And we gathered together with some people and people started bringing up their mowers, push and ride and all that stuff. And we just kind of worked our way through. And over the years, we've gotten some equipment and now we have some equipment that's all volunteers that do all of the work outside of our building, keeping the grounds taken care of. And we calculated that there was uh, 250 hours given just to mowing in the last year with more than 50 trees trimmed. They also moved inside and have changed uh, more than a hundred light bulbs. Um, we have a, an amazing mower, this Dixie Chopper. I'm not into all this stuff totally, but everybody that rides it really gets into the Dixie Chopper mower. We put 60 miles on that thing this year of just cutting the grass. And when it gets warm, if you don't know about the Dixie Chopper, we'll send you in the big field. Just go out there, have some fun. It'll be amazing. Um, and with that, it's been another 150 hours of people just weed eating in the, in the property. These are things that volunteers are investing in. We've got more than 250 hours given to our safety team and our emergency response. So if there's a, a medical emergency and making sure our facility is safe for us, um, people that are giving that time. We also gave away this year uh, more than 400 Bibles to people. You know, we've got these tables. You might've seen them on the way in and out. People, uh, we have a sign that lets you know if you want a Bible, take it for free. We believe the word of God uh, is powerful. And if we can get it in people's hands and they'll actually use it, we know God will show up for them in powerful ways in their life. And so we've been able to give those out to people. We gave away this last year $4,000 in Dollar Give Club to under-resourced people, people in need, ministries that we were partnered with. And this was our modeling what it means to be costly generous uh, to other people. And then finally, another 250 hours given to special events like Festival, Trunk or Treat, Easter Egg Hunts, Cookies with Santa, and all of that. Now, I know some of you, you've been calculating, you know where the numbers is. Others of you fell asleep five seconds ago, and you are sitting here at the, at the very least when we calculate this. That's more than 4,200 hours volunteered and committed to, given by you this year. Thank you all for the amazing work that you did this year. But we don't wanna just serve, we don't wanna just do events, we want to be about learning and growing and what it looks like to love God. And so we also know that this year we've been challenged, not just you, but us as communicators, as teachers. We've been challenged when we started talking this year about building our lives and saying, what does it look like? Even if we've been doing a lot of good Christian things and, and church-based things, but, but we've not truly built our lives on the foundation of God, the way that he wants us to live. And trusting that if we would align everything in our life to really building our lives the way that he would ask us to build them, then we experience the abundant life that he calls us to. We talked about the different heroes in the Bible, these seemingly insignificant people that God did extraordinarily significant things through. And it gave us an opportunity to go, man, in my ordinariness, I get to be a part of something extraordinary as God shows up and God works through me and in me. We talked about our manifesto, our values that drive us. We said, we want to know as a church, what does it look like for us to live out our mission, to love God, love others, and to impact the world? And some of these values we held on to is saying yes to God every time, saying that if God is good, if God is trustworthy, if God knows better than me and has insight greater than I do, then I want to be a person. We want to be a people that say yes to God every time whenever he would call us to do something. We also said we wanna be a community where there's no perfect people, where we recognize that we're all in process, that we all have areas that we can grow, we all have areas that, that we have our brokenness and, and maybe in the church we should be the place where we give people the freedom to show up in their brokenness and their imperfections so that they encounter God and get healing and restoration in those areas instead of trying to walk in the belief or the facade that would say that we have to be perfect to belong. You know, we said, what about if the, the value of awe and wonder where we're walking with God in such a way that we experience his presence and his power in moments where it just stops, uh, it stops us in our tracks. And we go, man, I'm just in awe and, and, I, and I, I'm overcome with wonder at this God and the work that he does and the love that he has for us. 
We said we need to be a church. We want to value longer tables and shorter fences. Essentially just saying, if I were to to look at my life and I see who I'm sitting around the table with and there's not people sitting at tables with me, sharing meals with me, doing life with me that don't look different than me, act different than me, to believe different than I do, then we need to create a longer table that invites people into our space. We need to lower the fences that keep us separated and insulated from the people around us and instead invite them into community with us. We talked about costly generosity and be able to give as Christ gave. We then said, what about leaving a legacy? If we valued leaving a legacy in our lives that said, instead of it being all about what I can do, I said, I'm gonna invest my energy and my time and my resources in a means of raising up other people, releasing other people, making them into their best selves, multiplying the efforts that I could do on my own, recognizing that that there's a value of, of bigger than us, that it's not about the vineyard, it's not about our church or merely my life, but it's about impacting the world, really. And recognizing that if all I'm going to focus on is, is immediately what impacts me, then I miss the opportunity in the invitation that God gives us. And then finally, the last value in that manifesto was disruptive faith. That if my faith isn't doing things in my life that is disrupting some of the rhythms or the patterns or the beliefs in my life, then I, I maybe need to lean in a little stronger to allow God to change me and grow me and challenge me. We then spend a little bit of time looking at things like skeletons in the closet. How can we bring into the light the things that we hide in darkness and allow God to illuminate them and transform them and change them and redeem them in our lives? And then over the last few months, we've been talking about this vision, this three-year vision of being for the city and saying that we believe that God is calling us to be present for people, talking about the city as where people live and do life and and love and cry and, and struggle, the places they call home, the places that they connect to. What about if we started to live with an outward posture towards where people are at? And we said, we want to be a church that's committed to building this multiplication movement where we're releasing people and we're not constantly building our stage as big as we can and trying to get people to come here, but instead we're training up and sending people out to go be the church in these areas and in these communities that need light, that need hope. We started to look at what it means for us as a, as a church to not just be multiplying, but to true, truly transform communities. To not go in with our plan and tell you how we're going to fix your life and change your life, but instead immerse ourselves in a community, understand the true needs, and then humbly go in with every effort that we can to bring transformation that is real and that is specific to the areas that God is calling us to go. See, we've had new members, we've had new teams, we've had several failures. Uh, Clearly, we also have had a number of great victories. And it'd be tempting in this moment for us as a church as we celebrate that, and maybe you've done this kind of with your own life already this year, it'd be tempting to just say, let's go ahead and set the bar even higher. Let's make the numbers bigger. Let's make the events grander. Let's try and give away more stuff, do all of these things. Let's shoot for more, more, more. But I believe God has something different in store for us. If we're willing to have the courage to take hold of it, and here's the, here's the rub, the reality is that if we take hold of the things that I think God is calling us to, the bigger and the better will come as well. Because the bigger and better is just who God is. He is bigger and better than me. His plans are greater than mine. His ways are higher than mine. If I would just submit myself to God truly and to his ways, then I will experience the greater. It will be bigger and better, but how? Because for many of us, we go through this every year. We stop, we reflect, we build our list and we've got our bad stuff and our good stuff. We start off the year with a ball of fire and kind of like Rachel said, some of us, our fire went out two days ago. I mean, it's hard to keep your your resolution going for five days so far. I mean, we, we struggle sometimes to keep that fire and to keep that passion going for us. Perhaps you have that ritual where you stop every year and you you write out your new plans and you talk about the things you want to do. Maybe it's reestablishing the one that you didn't get done the year prior. But maybe this is going to be the year. I vow this year I'm going to lose the 20 pounds. I'm going to work out five days a week. I'm going to wake up early and read my Bible every day. I'm not going to get angry with my spouse anymore. I am going to fundamentally change my life. I'm not going to waste money on things that I don't need, but I am going to make a difference. I am going to make a change this year. 
here's part of the danger. We can make these changes and these resolutions and we can convince ourselves that these are, are holy initiatives. Holy initiatives. Now, I'm not trying to diminish them, but I think sometimes we can trick ourselves. We can believe that, that if I do all these things, that, that somehow I'm engaged in this redemptive work of God and we can take scripture and sometimes get it to say something that aligns with what I want to believe. I, I was looking at this passage of scripture, which I've actually seen a few times. If, if it's you that wrote this I, or shared this, I, I mean no offense when I read it, but I'm going to read it anyways. Ephesians 4, verse 22 to 24, I, I started thinking about how people use this type of stuff when it comes to resolutions. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Man, I'm going to go ahead and put off that, that part of me that loves chocolate. And I'm going to pick up the, the new part of me that doesn't like chocolate anymore this year. You still like chocolate. You're just trying to change some behavior. We view it as behavior modification, but the scripture here is not telling you. It's not calling you to behavior modification. It's calling you to heart change, to real change, sustainable change. And I know that we can lose heart very quickly on these things. We can lose heart very quickly, and I, I don't necessarily think it's because of your goals. I, I think oftentimes it's because of a, a comparison game that we can get stuck in playing. Because my goal felt really cool until I looked at yours and then realized yours was awesome. Until I say, you know, I'm going to stretch myself and work out, you know, five days a week. We're five days in, and, and I've worked out one day, and you've already worked out ten times in the first five days of the year. Or, or you have a spiritual goal, and I compare it against mine. Mine looks like a, a cute little faith goal, and yours looks like godlike as far as your standard of what you're trying to pursue with God. And I can find myself over and over and over again, believing if I can just manage the right behavior, I can change the right behavior, that maybe this is going to be the year that I can go, new year, new me. New year, new me. I'm going to just change it all. I'm going to be a different person this year. I don't know if that's God's best. I don't know if that's the heart of God. You know, Carrie, uh, my wife, just wrote a post uh, recently and um, was kind of challenging some of the thoughts of how we approach the, the new year. And I want to share just a paragraph of, of what she said as kind of helping us, I believe, reframe how we can approach celebrating and remembering and looking at what God has done and then also leaning into what God's calling us to moving forward. She said this, if you're looking for some better version of yourself this year, the path toward pursuing that is far from glamorous. If someone's selling you a self-helpy plan or a program that's shiny or will help you arrive, be cautious. There's nothing you can accomplish or become this year that will make you any more worthy to be loved. If going to the gym to pursue some unattainable, idealized version of yourself is a goal, I'll save you some time and let you know that losing pounds or getting gains won't fix your insides. Will a new job or new goals or bigger salary hold the potential to change things? They won't change you or make you more worthy of love or value or care. What does that have to do with new year, new me? I think the answer is found in the reality for us that when we are saying and declaring and people put out their new year, new me, we're, we're declaring that the old me, the me that I, I was living for the last year or years prior is wrong, it needs to go away needs to be forgotten about, needs to be hidden, needs to be pushed in a corner and somehow need to be something completely different. You know, there's this reality that we have to take hold of, that God loves us right where we are, right as we are right now. And here's the thing, no matter how long your list of good or bad is from this last year, there is no amount of work this year there is no version of a new you. There is no modification of your behavior that will cause God's affection for you to grow. 
and I know this is the moment where some people, and I'm going to stereotype, I apologize for that, but, but I know that there are some of the ladies in the room that are going to be like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm with you. And some of the guys in the room, they're like, oh, here goes squishy love talk. Now, I actually believe that for those of us that go squishy love talk, we're the ones that need to hear this most. Because we're the ones that are striving the hardest to be, to perform, to change the old me and get rid of it, to become the new me. You see, there's a story in scripture that gives us this picture of, of God's love for us. Jesus is telling a story to illustrate a point. And he tells the story of the prodigal son. You, you've, I'm sure you've heard it. There's a dad and his two sons. The one son decides uh, he's okay being faithful and honoring his dad. The other decides he wants to create a new self, a new life. And he asks his dad for his version or his, his, his portion of uh, his inheritance. He takes the money, he goes off and he creates a new self, a new life. He parties it up. He lives it up big. He is living this lavish lifestyle until all the money runs out. And he finds himself eating out of a trough of food next to pigs. And, and he finds that all the things that he thought the new self were going to be didn't change the pain and the stuff on the inside. And so he finds himself going, when I can't fall any further, he finally goes, you know what, maybe I should go back to my dad's house. He takes better care of his servants than, than I am being taken care of right now. And this son decides he's going to go home. And I think sometimes when we hear this story, we, we, we start to be invited into thinking, am I like the, the son that stayed home who's now trying to shame his brother because, I mean, he was the bad one and he's the good one? And, or are we like the, the son that went out and took advantage of all these plans and now he's coming home and we have to check ourselves? Are we taking for granted the blessings of God and all those things? I actually think Jesus was trying to highlight part of this story for us about the dad. And for some of us, we need to recognize for us, especially in this new year, that in this story, the, the father of that returning son was, was waiting and looking for his son. And as Jesus told the story, he describes a father who runs to his son in that moment before anything had been set right. Before anything had been set right, he didn't know if his son was there to apologize, his son was there to gloat, he didn't know why his son was back, but he actually didn't care. He simply wanted to love his son. And God gives us this picture. And I mean this as, as truthfully as I can say it, and maybe theologically squishy, I don't know that God cares all that much about how long you've been walking away from him or how many times your old me has shown up. I think that if we are a people that are willing to turn towards God and instead of just behavior managed, but actually just bring our old self to him, he's not going to put the old self to death and shame us and guilt us for us and, and make us into this thing that I actually think God redeems and restores the broken parts of us. It becomes a part of our story that we can relate to other people in. And God does that without regard for things being made right first. Scripture tells us that Jesus died for us while we were sinners, not once we recognized we were sinners or once we recognized we needed help, but while we were still sinners. His regard and his love for us is not contingent upon our behaviors. So I just wonder if maybe this year our cry should not be new year, new me. Again, not beating you up if you said that. I think there's some beauty in that. But, but what about if it wasn't new year, new me, but instead new year, true me. True me, the, the, the real person that I'm supposed to be, the person that God sees, the, the way that God cares for me, the love that God has for me. And this is where it gets hard. Because I stand in front of you as somebody that would say, I get this idea in my mind. I love it. I love the idea in my mind. But in my heart, I struggle sometimes. Because I read passages like this in Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39. You may have heard this before, but let it, let it be heard new today. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future nor any powers or height or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love this passage. 
Nothing can separate us from the love of God. My sin, my failure, my old self, nothing can separate me from the love that God has for me. And yet I believe that though God's love does not change, many of us don't receive it because we like the son have turned our back on a father that just wants us to come back to him. And we keep walking in the other way. And though his love doesn't change and his love doesn't fail and nothing can separate us from that love except the moment that we refuse to receive it. You see, God's love is still there. All we have to do is turn and receive it. He'll run to us just like that father in that story. And he does it, I believe, before everything is set right. His love is not conditional. His love sees you as you are this year and says, guess what? If you don't lose those 10 pounds, I still love you. If you still blow up occasionally in your life, I still love you. If your financial life is a wreck, I still love you. Look at this powerful scripture because here's, here's the reality. Many of us will take this year and say, hey, it's, it's not that the heart change has happened. It's not that my life is fundamentally different. I have just figured out how to put on the right mask, the right, right veneer, the right picture of who I should be and how I should feel. And yet scripture tells us these shaking truths. Hebrews 4, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Your life might look different to other people on the outside, but nothing is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Therefore, because God sees and knows everything, since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. And the faith that we possess in this moment that they're talking about, the writer here is talking about, is the faith that Jesus as high priest, it's a, a picture for the people and a picture for us of somebody that has gone before us and has made right the brokenness of our life, has restored the relationship for us. So you're saying, hold on to this faith that Jesus actually did what the scriptures tell us he did and that he's in the position and has the authority to be restoring us to right relationship with God, making all things right again. And then in verse 15, for we do not have this high priest though, who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. I think this is just letting you know, look, God understands, God feels your pain. He understands your struggle. He understands the pain that you feel when you look at the list and how much good and how much bad my desire to just be different. But then the encouragement, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, not the throne of judgment, not the throne of shame, not the throne of beating me up for failing once again, but the throne of grace. And let's approach that with confidence because of the faith that I hold, that there is a God that loves me and pursues me and that I don't have to perform for so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You see, I've come to the place where I am actually starting to look at resolutions differently. I I think resolutions for for many of us are actually areas of need that we've clothed in a different veneer. We've given a different name, but they're areas of need. My goal to lose weight 10, 20 pounds is because I have insecurity about how I feel and I question if I'm beautiful and if I'm lovely. I want to go ahead and and, and say that my goal is going to be that I'm going to read my Bible every day and I'm going to wake up 10 minutes early because you know what? I have a a need in my life to have the, the confidence that my God loves me even when I don't get up early to read my Bible. I put things in place. Oftentimes calling it a resolution, calling it a change, but in the the midst of that, there's this great need and the the scriptures are telling us that if we want the needs met in our life, the area that you need God to show up, the way we do that is we approach the throne of grace where God just shows his love to you freely with confidence and we allow grace and mercy to wash over us because that's the way God loves us. That's the freedom he brings us. And so for me this year, I... I don't want to, and I, I'm, I'm not shaming anyone that does it, but I don't want 2020 to be about a word for me or even a conviction or a, a to-do list. 
I want 2020 to be a commitment on my part to having it be a new year in the most true me that I can be. True to who God says I am, true to my heart and myself, true to the wonder of who I am in the eyes of God. And I believe that if I were to really take hold of that, if we took hold of that, all the things that God wants to call us to do over the next year, if we would live out of that place, if we would embrace those truths, God would take care of all the rest of it. Losing weight's not a bad thing. Reading your Bible's not a bad thing. Working on relationships is not a bad thing. But when we are just trying to either change behavior or we're trying to find value in those things, we're missing the beauty and simplicity of God's love for us. And that is the place that we're invited to live out of. We're gonna spend the next few weeks actually talking about some of these things, pressing into some of these things and really starting to wrestle with what it looks like for us to be living into this truth of the true self that God's calling us to be, of what the scriptures say about us, of what God says about us, of what, about what God's uh, actions have revealed about us. And I believe if we allow ourselves to move into that space and we feel this overwhelming love of God for us, it will transform our lives. And so I actually wanna give you an opportunity today to do something that I, I never quite know how something's gonna work out until we try it. And I've been amazed at how many people have come to me after service last night and, and uh, just this last service at 9.30 to share how God showed up for them in this moment. I, I'm just gonna give us a, a minute. I, I'm gonna pray, but I'm gonna give us a minute first where we're just gonna have a minute of silence. I, I just wanna invite you to do this. Some of you have been running the list and you've written out all your goals and all the things you wanna do. And today I wanna invite you just to take all of those things and throw one lens on them and ask God or, or just process it if you're not sure about your relationship with God yet, you just kind of reflect on it. Answer the question in light of everything else that you say you want to do and everything you want to change and everything you want to see happen. What would it look like for you this year to truly take hold of the truest version of you? For some of you, you're gonna know immediately there's something you need to stop doing. Some of you, there's something you need to start doing. Some of you, it's gonna be that you have to discipline yourself in a different way. Some of you just have to be willing to receive. Some of you will have to be willing to share and be vulnerable. Some of you will have to do any number of different things. But I believe that there are things in our life that if we will listen to God, if we'll listen to our hearts, that we will have the spirit of God in us, prompting us, leading us into all truth to be able to say, this is who you are in the eyes of God. What do you need to do to receive that truth this year? And so in the next minute, I'll, I'll be quiet and then I'll pray for us. But I just invite you to think, ask God, what's it gonna take for me to be the truest self I can be this year? The truth of who you see me, the truth of how you love me. And to live that out in this new year. Let's take just a moment. Father God, we just ask that you would allow us this year as your people called by you to accomplish great things in this world that seek to love people really well in the way that you love us. I, I pray God that, that we would first allow ourselves to be loved completely, purely by you. God, I ask that you would speak to us the truths that you hold about us, the truths about life in you. God, 
God, I pray that you would allow us. God, to just be a people that don't despise where we've been, but let our lives be a testimony. As we read about all through scripture, women and men that were broken and sinful, encountering Jesus and having their life changed forever. That we too, God, would not despise our brokenness, but that it would be a testimony of your power and of your strength. And that the true me would be a person that has been redeemed and restored. That dead areas in our lives would be brought back to life. That broken things would be mended and put back together. God, I pray that you would allow us as a church to do everything out of a deeply loved place. God, continue to do your work as you've been doing this weekend. Go with us this week, God. Let us be your people living out the truest expression of what it means to be your beloved children. We love you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I wanna encourage you before you go, we've got prayer team folks that are here every week. We, we believe that sometimes you need a voice, a person to go between you and God, not because you can't go to God, but because you're tired or you're doubting or you need someone to have faith for you or belief for you. Please come and get prayer before you go. If you are new, I'd love to meet you uh, in the lobby. Everyone else, have a great rest of your week. I pray that you are uh, deeply loved by God this week and that you're able to love others as well. Have a great week.